Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Lowy Institute's beautiful headquarters at 31 Bly Street. Let me welcome in particular board members of the Institute who are with us this afternoon, Finland's ambassador to Australia, her Australian counterpart, the EU ambassador to Australia, as well as the Finnish Minister for Development and Foreign Trade and other distinguished guests. I'm Michael Fullilove, the Executive Director of the Lowy Institute. Allow me to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the land on which the Institute stands, the Gadigal of the Eora Nation. I acknowledge their elders past and present. As many of you know, it's been a very busy month or two at the Institute. We've published important research on very busy month or two at the Institute. We've published important research on Chinese coercion, Australian resilience, Australia's links to Southeast Asia, as well as our brilliant Pacific aid map. We've hosted leaders from around the world, including the Prime Minister of Singapore, India's External Affairs Minister, the Director General of the World Trade Organization, and of course, the President of Ukraine. But we are particularly excited that our last international guest for 2022 is the first ever Finnish Prime Minister to visit Australia, Ms. Sana Marin. Let me, thank you. And let, let me just say, PM, Teva to lower Sydneyan. Uh, I might say I used that phrase on the PM special advisor earlier and she had no idea what I was saying, which doesn't speak well of my accent. I have to tell you, PM, the announcement last week that you would speak to the Institute prompted a flood of interest from people who wanted to attend. Apparently half of Sydney are experts on Finland. We could certainly have filled this room several times over, which is a compliment to you. Ladies and gentlemen, Sana Marin has been involved in politics from a young age. She served as a city council leader before she was elected to the Finnish parliament in 2015. She served as Minister of Transport and Communications, and then in 2019, she was appointed Prime Minister of Finland. From a distance, I've observed that Miss Marine is intelligent, accomplished, and plain spoken, which is, of course, accords with the reputation of the Finns. We saw this quality in October, Prime Minister, when a journalist asked about an off-ramp for Russia in Ukraine. And he asked about a way out of the conflict. And you looked a bit quizzical and you repeated the question. And then you said, a way out of the conflict, the way out of the conflict is for Russia to leave Ukraine. That's the way out of the conflict. And you walked off. I think, ladies and gentlemen, the technical term for that is a mic drop. Um, <laughs> As I said, this is the first visit by a Finnish Prime Minister to Australia. I don't believe it's a coincidence that it's happening now, even as Finland is on the frontiers of the struggle to defend Ukraine. Because Russia's aggression has reminded all of us in all of the world's democracies how much we have in common with each other. And whether it's Prime Ministers or Foreign Ministers or even think tank directors, we're all reaching out to each other to our counterparts in like-minded countries. The connections between the democracies are quickening. And that's one of the reasons, one of several reasons, why we are so pleased to host the Prime Minister today. So let me now invite Sana Marine to address the Lowy Institute on how a strong Europe can contribute to a more secure world. PM. Dear Director of the Lowe Institute, Michael Fullilov, thank you for your kind words. Your Excellencies, distinguished guests. I'm pleased to be here to address the Lowe Institute today. Relations between Finland and Australia are excellent. We are long-standing, like-minded partners with a strong commitment to our common democratic values and the rule-based international order. Finland also participates actively in shaping the agenda for cooperation between the European Union and Australia. Both of our countries have built strong partnerships across the world. As the global security environment changes and our common values become increasingly challenged, partnerships based on trusts matter more and more. Finland and Sweden will soon join NATO, which means we will be part of the same network of alliances linking us with North America. More broadly, we see countries sharing the same values within the Euro-Atlantic and Indo-Pacific regions finding each other. 
The change in global security environment is bringing us closer together. Australia has a unique perspective on the Indo-Pacific region. Here, many of our common challenges and great opportunities are either seized or lost. This has been well understood also by the European Union, which held recently the EU-Australia summit and negotiates with Australia on a new free trade agreement. My distinct dis discussion here in Sydney will also give useful background as later, later in December we meet the leaders of the ASEAN in Brussels. But importantly, Australia has always been a key global actor with whom we can make multilateral order a force for good. Nowhere are our common efforts more needed than in our fight against climate change and loss of biodiversity. Australia's new ambitions and leadership are highly valued and timely. We need to move away from fossil fuels and develop cleaner energy solutions such as hydrogen together. We must move forward after COP27 climate conference as we have no alternatives of, to keeping the 1.5 degree target alive. Our national aim is to be carbon neutral by 2035 and carbon negative soon after that. Dear attendees, just when the world should be coming together and taking joint action to tackle the great challenges of our times, Russia's war against Ukraine has confronted us all with a new and more serious challenge. Russia's illegal and brutal war against Ukraine, the killing of thousands upon thousands of Ukrainian soldiers and civilians, and the continuing acts of terror require strong, firm and global response. When Russia, a per permanent member of the United Nations Security Council, preaches the UN Charter with total impunity, disregards and violates international law and commits war crimes, we all have very much to lose in Europe, in the Pacific region and elsewhere. The energy crisis, the food crisis and rising inflation are all of Russia's making. This winter will not only be hard for Ukraine, but also in our societies. However, our hardship comes and goes. The Ukrainians are fighting for their survival and future as a free nation. We must continue our support. There are no alternatives. We must do whatever it takes so that Ukraine will win the war. There will eventually be time for peace but peace has to come the Ukrainian terms. We must step up our efforts to make Russia's leadership realize that it has only to lose from this war, and lose it will. Here I want to welcome Australia's strong and clear leadership and important concrete contributions in helping Ukraine and putting pressure against Russia with sanctions. We are together, shoulder to shoulder, work working to make Russia lose its war. Your role is highly valued in Europe and certainly most of all in Ukraine. Just as the COVID-19 pandemic proved that the European Union can act together against major threats and the EU has been both united and very effective in responding to Russia's aggression. The European Union is now considering new sanctions against Russia. This will be the ninth package of sanctions since the 24th of February we will like, likely find a way to limit the import of fossil fuels from Russia even further with this round. Finland is pushing for even harder sanctions that would cover the ent entire energy sector. Even though we have already diversified our energy sources and built up our security of supply before the war, the energy crisis also hurts as Finns. As our most important markets in Europe suffer from supply shortages, higher energy prices and rising inflation. We should continue to weaken Russia's ability to finance the war. We must make the sanctions more effective. Our focus should also be on closing the loopholes in current sanctions and cracking down the attempts to circumvise them. Here too we need partners like Australia. Finland has been an important transit country and tourist destination for Russians. We have therefore stopped issuing tourist visas to Russia's citizens. It became morally unacceptable 
to allow the Russian's middle and upper class to continue to enjoy their vacations in Europe while their army kills, tortures and terrorizes Ukrainians. These Russians are largely still insulated from the ugly faces of war. The freezing of the assets of selected Russians, the oligarchs close to Putin, is an important part of our common action. We should find legal ways to confiscate these assets and use them for reconstruction in Ukraine. These efforts are ongoing within the European Union and we expect to discuss our op options in some form or another in our next European Council later in December. The European Union is currently preparing a new package of assistance to Ukraine. This macroeconomic assistance will be worth of 18 billion euros. We all are also stepping up our support for Ukraine defense forces through the European Peace Facility. The EU will now have a training mission for the Ukrainian military in which Finland will also participate. Finland has just delivered its 10th national package of weapons and military equipment, including heavy weapons, to Ukraine. When our development and humanitarian aid are counted together, we have given over 300 million euros in assistance in Ukraine. And more is on the way. What we need now is the active engagement of the private sector so that Ukrainians can get energy, water and sanitation equipment for the winter. New kinds of public-private partnerships and instruments are crucial. Make no mistake, if Russia wins its terrible gamble, it will not be only one to feel empowered. Others will also be tempted by the same dark agenda. Dear friends, we need to draw the right lessons from the recent global challenges, wars and crises in increasingly critical areas of our societies, from medical equipment to new technologies and energy, we have become far too dependent on cooperation with regimes that do not share our common values. Globalization has lifted large populations out of poverty and we must pursue it wherever we can. Finland stands as prime example of how openness and global trade can make a nation stronger. That said, Openness and cooperation have not changed the world enough. Our dependencies are becoming our weaknesses faster and in more important areas of our societies than we would like to happen. The right lessons from Europe is to build strategic autonomy in key sectors with its trusted partners. We are not building walls but seeking reliable solutions together. I have had the great opportunity to address these important topics recently with key leaders such as Prime Minister of Japan, His Excellency Fumio Kishida, the Prime Minister of India, His Excellency Narendra Modi and many others. We need to discuss it with all our partners and allies, especially Canada and the United States. Dear attendees, with Australia we should join our lifelines together. We see important potential in more cooperation with you in areas such as clean energy, critical raw materials and new technologies. The European Union and Australia are currently finalizing the negotiations for a new free trade agreement. The agreement needs to help us in building resilient value chains and common base for developing our skills and know-how. Businesses will be final judges of how, of how our markets integrate with one another, but standards, rules and financial in incentives matter. Importantly, as leaders, we owe it to businesses and consumers to be open about our long-term risks as we see them from our political perspectives. As we make important advan advances in science, research and innovation, there is an increasing risk that we will do that we will also create new dependencies. Authoritarian regimes will try to exploit them and abuse the lack of level playing field. As digitalization becomes more and more important part of our most basic services, we must be able to trust technology. Our common lifelines have to be based on solid cooperation in science, research and innovation as well. The EU and Australia should develop a regular dialogue in the use of new technologies and their international regulation. 
the EU also have many instruments available in concrete terms, from its Global Gateway Programme to Horizon Europe, the EU's funding programme for research and innovation. European strategic autonomy is as much about building resilience, deepening European integration and taking, taking strategic responsibility for Europe as it is about being a good partner. Among our partners and allies, we owe this first and foremost to our most vital and long-term partner, the United States. We need to take better responsibility of our continent and in many glo uh, and today's globalized world. This means stronger partnerships based on trust and shared values. Dear friends, it is very important to build level playing fields. We need to demand fairness from all trade and investment partners in the world. However, the recent wars, crises and disasters have shown that this will not be enough. Open, democratic and progressive societies also need stronger strategic autonomy in critically important areas for their citizens, supported by trusted partners. Cooperation among progressive democracies is now more important than ever. Our common values, universal human rights and democracy need to be defended with new force, new determination. We need to build bridges across Euro-Atlantic and the Indo-Pacific region. This is the right time for the first ever visit to a fin uh, from a Finnish Prime Minister to Australia. And this is the right moment to strengthen our bilateral relations. Thank you so much. <laughs> PM, thank you for those strong and wide-ranging remarks that will be read closely. I really like the line of uh, common lifelines and joining our lifelines together. Um, thank you for agreeing to take some questions. I'm going to kick off with half a dozen or so, and then I'm going to go to the audience. So, um, so start thinking. Um, let me begin. Your country shares a 1,300-kilometre border with Russia. It's often said that the first responsibility of any prime minister or any leader is to keep her country or his country secure and safe. How has your conception of your job changed since February? Well, of course, uh, we are all in a very difficult situation in Europe because of the war of Ukraine. And of course, it changed the agenda uh, of our government, of all the uh, key institutions, the parliament, uh, and, and we also have a president uh, in Finland that has a key mm -hmm. role in, in security and foreign policy. So, of course, all of our focus is now uh, on the war, uh, in, in the war, and, and also uh, how, what it means uh, to Europe in many ways. And as I said uh, in, in my speech, I think we have to learn lessons from this war. We cannot be dependent on critical matters. Now we are too dependent on energy coming from Russia. Mm -hmm. And that actually means very concrete things. It means that we are financing the war every day because we are buying energy from Russia. And we have to make sure that we don't have those kind of dependencies uh, in the future. But Foreign and security policy are now the key areas that we are engaged every day in our government and also uh, in our societies in many ways. All right, I'm going to come back to those vulnerabilities that you mentioned a little bit later. But first of all, let me ask you about President Zelensky. In October, I was lucky enough to host him on this stage, albeit by Zoom. Of course, you met with him in Kyiv earlier in the year. You were one of the first world leaders to go to Kyiv to meet him. What were your observations of him as a leader? And as a, as a fellow politician, I guess you have a particular appreciation for the task he has. So how have you appreciated how he's gone about doing his job? Well, I've met uh, President Zelensky uh, many times, uh, live and, and also uh, through Zoom and, and, and Teams, uh, as we all have been doing during the COVID as well. And he has been participating in many European uh, Council meetings, mm -hmm. as well telling us the situation in Ukraine. And it was really me memorable, the visit uh, to Kiev, to Ukraine, uh, during the war. And I remember vividly uh, about the, the different sides uh, of Kiev mm -hmm. during my visit. President Zelensky, also Prime Minister Mikhail, and, and others uh, from the government 
were in the government buildings, bunkers, there were sand, uh, sand sacks uh, everywhere and, and it was very secure, the, the halls were dark so mm. that, that you couldn't spot where we uh, were moving. But at the same time, people on the streets, on the parks, they were uh, trying to live as normal life as possible. So there are uh, these different uh, scenes in, in Kiev and in Ukraine uh, as we speak. Uh, President Zelensky is a very brave, uh, courageous man, and I think the whole Ukrainian nation, they are so courageous mm. right now, fighting for their freedom, fighting for their serenity uh, and, and their, uh, their nation uh, as such. So I think we have to support them every way we can. They are so heroic and we must make sure that they will win. I think in that visit you also visited Butcher. Yes, so how and did, Irpin as well. And how did, how did those visits, uh, the, the revelation of the darkest, the darkest sides of this conflict, how did that affect you? Well, we visited uh, Irpin and Butcher and saw the mass graves, saw what Russians has, had done. Uh, and I'm thinking, I was thinking then and thinking still about the regions where there are still Russian military troops. And we have seen uh, terrible footages, we have heard terrible stories, uh, and we know that there are um, rapes that are actively part of the war, there are tortured, uh, tortured uh, civilians, there are these terrible actions happening every day. And the Ukrainians, they are not fighting for themselves. They are also fighting for the European values, democratic values. And we must make sure that they will not only win, but they will thrive uh, in the future. We want to make sure that they uh, can become members of European uh, Union, that they will have a bright future ahead of them. I remember also that F Finland were in war. We mm -hmm. have been in war with Russia. And our story after the war, when we gained our independence, is a successful one. We mm -hmm. have built our welfare nation, we have uh, educated our people, we have a good perspective to the future uh, also from, from this point. So we have to make sure that also the Ukrainians have that hope, that they will have a bright future ahead of them. They are now fighting for their lives, they are fighting for their f freedom, but they are also fighting for a better future. This is the hope that, that gives them strength right now and we have to make sure that we will boost that hope, that we will help them and that we will give, uh, be by, side, by their, their sides uh, to building this, this better future. Let me ask you about Finland. Um, given Finland's strategic location and given its, given its history, um, alongside its remarkable social democracy, Finland is also a remarkably resilient country. Um, a country that is able to mobilise hundreds of thousands of, of people for, for military service and do a lot to defend itself. So tell us, uh, as, as a progressive leader, how, how has Finland managed to do both of these things, uh, a strong social democracy but strong national security at the same time? Well, I think if you ask Finnish people what is the most, most important thing uh, in, in our nation and what we want to make sure uh, to the future, it's to be secure because of our history. The number one priority for us is to be secure, that we have our independence, that, that we have that possibility to decide ourselves. That is the most important thing. And next week we will actually celebrate uh, the 6th of, of December, our Independence Day, uh, which is always uh, the key day for the year. Uh, and we are very proud to be independent and we are very proud to also be a welfare society. But we have to be wise because we know that we have an aggressive neighbour. We know that we have 1,300 kilometres border with Russia. So during the same time that we have educated our citizens and building the welfare society, social and healthcare systems and making sure that we have that well-being, at the same time we have always resourced uh, our military and we have made investments uh, to our security because we know that that if we don't do that, if we don't maintain that resilience and that, that uh, for example, defence forces, uh, the future might not be a bright one for us. And this is also why we're now joining NATO, because we want to make sure that in the future there won't ever again be war on Finnish soil. So let me ask you about NATO, because you're right 
Finland's always taken a muscular approach to its own security, standing on its own feet. But even in, as late as last year, it probably would have been unthinkable to most that Finland and Sweden would join NATO. I think you and I were discussing a poll this week that said that I think 85% of Finns approve of the decision to seek membership of NATO. Tell us a bit about how your government made this transition this year. How did you get to such a strong <coughs> national support for such an important consequential decision? Well, I think that the mentality and the opinions of Finnish people changed immediately when Russia attacked Ukraine. I just told you that, that uh, us Finns, the most important thing is to make sure that our nation and our citizens are safe uh, and secure. And up till uh, the 24th of February, uh, the way to do that was to have working bilateral relationship, relations with Russia, uh, to be uh, not part of NATO with close partners, but not uh, a member of, of NATO. So that was the way to secure our nation. That was the best way to secure a nation. We had the possibility to apply NATO membership, uh, and this is written in our uh, foreign security policy papers. So that was always an option, but wasn't discussed. But after Russia attacked Ukraine, I think the mentality of people changed immediately. I noticed it changed uh, for me a bit earlier, but, but, but still, uh, it shifted overnight, I would say. And then we had the process during the spring of joining NATO to gather all the institutions, the president, the government, uh, the parliament, but also all the political parties to have this process together, the building uh, that kind of, uh, not uni unanimity, but, but very uh, large acceptance of, of joining NATO. And out of 200, 100, 188 parliamentarians voted in favor of applying NATO membership because we were on the same page. We had that discussion uh, and, and we, we worked together very closely like we always do when it comes to foreign and security policy. We are a small country and we are next to Russia. So it's in our interest uh, and our, it secures our, our position that we are unanimous when it comes to foreign and security policy. This is also something uh, that, that Finland uh, is known for, for its unanimity or, or uh, this, this large support uh, of all the political actors and also the, the citizens when it comes to foreign and security policy. And what kind of NATO member would, would Finland be? Would you uh, send your forces to exercise with other NATO countries? Would you fully integrate your military with other NATO forces? Well, we would be a full member. Mm -hmm. uh, we would, of course, have the discussion later after we will join. Uh, we will have the discussion later, uh, for example, whether or not there should be... Uh, nuclear weapons in, in Finnish soil or, or permanent bases, etc. I don't think that there are anyone to want us to have, have those, but, but we will have that kind of sorts of uh, discussions mm -hmm. later. Mm -hmm. It's not act actively discussed uh, now. We are focusing on applying the NATO membership uh, and we will be a security provider to NATO. We have uh, extensive armed forces in Finland. We have a lot of capabilities. We are already uh, spending over 2% of our na nation's GDP to defence. So we are a strong player when it comes to defence and, and security. So we would be a security provider. And we also are working closely together with Sweden that applied at the same time. And we had very good cooperation and similar kind of uh, process during the, the spring and had very good connections with our Swedish colleagues. And they will also bring uh, security uh, to NATO. They have, for example, very good uh, uh, defense um, industry uh, when it comes to submarines mm, and, mm. and planes and, mm. and all. Well, thank you for mentioning, mentioning submarines because I want to ask you about... I want to ask you about... I, I thought I could <laughs> lead you there because I know you want very, to ask. Very helpful. <laughs> uh, no, I want to ask you about AUKUS. Um, uh, I know that not everybody in Europe was, was excited when <clears throat> AUKUS was announced and President Macron was very disappointed. Um, and I'm, I'm sure you don't want to get involved in too much commentary on Australia's arrangements, but as a, as a small country that's right next to Russia, can you understand why 
in the face of uh, a more assertive China, a country like Australia would want to tighten its connections to the United States and develop a deterrent capability like nuclear-propelled conventionally armed submarines? Does it make intuitive sense to you? Well, I won't go to details. I would only say that the decisions are made. I think we should focus on the future and it's very important that we would be able to negotiate the free trade agreement uh, that would boost our both economies that would be very important for, for European Union, for Australia. Uh, and we need that tight cooperation uh, between our countries and, and between our areas. Uh, but of course, I understand uh, out of the August, uh, uh, deal. Uh, of course, I understand the worries that, that you have uh, on China. I think we all have worries when it comes to China. Uh, and we must make sure that we don't have that kind of critical dependencies mm. when it comes to China. Mm. I don't mean that we shouldn't trade or that we shouldn't have uh, connections to China. Of course, we do. Uh, that's a reality. And we will also have those in, in the future. But those critical dependencies, that we must get rid of so that we have also alternative trading routes, that we have the know-how, the knowledge, the new technologies for our dig digitalized societies mm. because we cannot be dependent, for example, microchips or semiconductors or, or any kind of critical technologies when it comes to authoritarian countries because if those trading routes would be uh, cut suddenly, then we would be in trouble. Our uh, businesses, our industries will be in trouble. Our total whole economies will collapse. So it would be only wise to make sure and in advance that you don't have critical dependencies uh, that will cripple your entire economy if there would be some kind of uh, willingness uh, to do so. Let me ask you more broadly about China. How do you see China as a, as a global player? I mean, how do you balance the different elements of China's identity? I know you've been somewhat critical, I think, of some of human, the human rights record of China in the past. On the other hand, it's a huge global economy. It's powering economic growth. It's essential to solving uh, the dilemma of climate change. What are your observations about China? How do you think about China as an actor on the global stage? China is a key player. China is a big country and key player. We need China when it comes to fighting climate change, when it comes to fighting biodiversity. We need China uh, to defend multilateral international order. I think uh, one of our biggest challenge that is shown now because of the Russian war uh, in Ukraine is that the international rule-based order is being challenged. There are countries like Russia that is now putting the rules aside and doing whatever they want. And this is something that we cannot approve. So we must stand behind our values and understand that there is a war and fight uh, concerning values going on in the world. And we have to make sure that our values, the democratic values, will win. So we cannot be naive. This is the time, this is the time to stop being naive also when it comes to China. And that is why I'm speaking so much about European strategic autonomy. That doesn't mean that we would uh, close all, all doors and windows to everybody else. It doesn't mean that. It means that actually we need much more deeper cooperation between our democratic partners like mm. Australia. Mm. We should have that free trade agreement. We should have that, that connections when it comes to, for example, uh, raw materials or new technologies. We should have those tight, tight connections as democratic countries and cut the dependencies on authoritarian regimes where they are critical. You mentioned climate change and your government has been a world leader in terms of setting a very ambitious um, target there. How does the war in Ukraine, how is that impeding multilateral action on climate change? Isn't it harder to, um, to make progress at Sharm el-Sheikh, to make progress in multilateral discussions when, you're, when Russia is behaving in the way that it does? How do you, how do you, how do you prevent the, a focus on the urgent crowding out the important? Mm. Well, I think climate is an urgent issue uh, and we should do more and we should do faster, uh, that's a given. Uh, and it's in everybody's interest to make sure that, that 
the warmth uh, of, of our planet is stopped by 1.5 degrees. It will cost us a lot if we won't manage that. So it's in everybody's interest. It's in China's interest, it's in Russia's interest, it's in Europeans and Australians' uh, interest to make sure that, that we will stop climate change. And we should also see all the potential we see as Finns, as our nation wants to reach the climate target of becoming climate neutral by 2035, that it will boost our economy. When climate change is the biggest threat that we face, actually tackling and fighting climate change is our biggest uh, opportunity for economic growth. Green transition, digital transition, making sure that our ec economies, our businesses uh, are sustainable. It's a big boost uh, for, for our economies. So we want to show that, that when you are fighting climate change, you can create new greener jobs, you can uh, have your people's well-being to the next level that, that you will thrive as a society. So we want to show uh, an example. All right, one more question on politics, and I'm going to go to the audience. Um, you're going to meet with the Australian Prime Minister, Mr Albanese, straight after this event. Um, he leads a government made up of one political party. You lead a coalition government made up of five political parties. Are you a little bit jealous? <laughs> well, um, of course, there are a lot of negotiations when you have uh, many partners in the government, but this is the Finnish way. We have always have coalition governments, and there are always, of course, problems when it comes to coalitions, different ideologies, different views on issues. And you have to find a way to have uh, compromises and, and trying to find consensus on, on different issues from different, also from different value point, um, values point of view. So, of course, there are always difficulties, but I think there are also difficulties when it comes to to governments with only one party, because then you have the same difficulties within the party. Mm. So, so I think the number of problems is always mm. the same, whether you have mm. the coalition mm. government or uh, mm. government with only one party. No, we never have factional problems in Australian politics. No, no, no. That never happens. All right, I'm going to take some questions from the audience. The first hand I saw was Susanna Patton at the back from the Lowy Institute. If I can ask people, put up their hand. If you get the call, please ask a brief question, make it a question, and identify yourself before you ask your question. Susanna Patton. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Um, many people in Australia want to see European countries play a greater role in the Indo-Pacific, and many European countries have announced policies to do so. I'd be interested in your reflections on how the conflict in Ukraine could affect prospects for greater European engagement in our region here. Thank you. Well, I think it will create more opportunities uh, also to tighten our cooperation. As I mentioned, we have to learn lessons from this war. And one lesson is that we need our partners. We need our partners. We need that cooperation between democratic countries. I think Australia and New Zealand are key players uh, in this part of the world. Uh, but we also need uh, Japan. We need South Korea. We need India. We need many others on board to making sure that there are uh, strength in democracies, that we are defending our values, that we are de defending, for example, the international rule-based order. There must be rules in the world that we all obey. If there's not, there's only chaos, and we cannot, uh, we cannot allow that kind of ideology win. So, so I think this is also an opportunity to tighten uh, those uh, relations and, and partnerships and cooperation. So, so I think Europe will and wants to have uh, a foot uh, also in the Indo-Pacific and, and the free trade agreements that we already set up with, with New Zealand and hopefully soon with Australia, those only show that, that we want to strengthen our partnerships. I saw Isabel Rowe with her hand up. Isabel? No, no, I think in the, behind you, Andrew, yes. Oh, Hi, I'm Isabel Rowe from the Australian Broadcasting Corporation. Thanks, Prime Minister, for your address. I just wanted to ask, um, what sort of responsibility do you believe that China has to reign in Russia? And how much leverage do you think that Xi Jinping has over Putin? Well, I think China could play uh, an important role to stop the war uh, if they want it. Uh, and it's up to China how they want to act concerning the war. But we shouldn't only rely on that uh, about 
China or, or any others, we should make sure that we are stronger. And now, I must be very honest, brutally honest with you, Europe isn't strong enough right now. We would be in trouble without the United States involving uh, the, the war in Ukraine. The United States has given a lot of weapons, a lot of financial aid, a lot of humanitarian aid to Ukraine, and Europe isn't strong enough yet. And we have to make sure that, that we are also building those capabilities when it comes to European defence, European defence industry, uh, and, and making sure that, that we could cope in different kinds of situations. I have met many uh, politicians from the United States and, and they all think that, that, that Europe should be stronger. They don't see it uh, as opposing the United States, but they see it as partners. And I think, think that you need to be strong to be a strong partner. So I'm fully supporting uh, the European strategic autonomy, that we should build our own resilience and also our own capabilities when it comes to defense, but also many other uh, matters. Speaking of the United States, your prime ministership has covered both the, the administration of Mr. Trump and the administration of Mr. Biden. Have you seen what, what's the biggest change that you've noticed in US foreign policy over that period? Do you think Mr. Trump, for example, would have played, would have supported Ukraine as strongly as Mr. Biden has? Well, of course, it's, it's very difficult to say um, what would have happened if the, the current administration wouldn't be, be in place. We are very grateful to the United States that they are so involved in, in the war in Ukraine. Their, their value is very crucial uh, right now. And of course, we hope that they will continue supporting, supporting Ukraine, weapons uh, and help of, of all sorts. Um, I'm very happy that the Biden administration has come back to the international fora, that they are now involved in international uh, affairs and, and that they are keen of building partnerships. And I, of course, hope that also in the future, United States would want to be partners and want to build that cooperation between Europe uh, and the United States, but also all, all others. We need more cooperation. We don't need less, we need more. And the current administration is uh, involving uh, involved in, in these uh, areas. All right, I saw Rory Medcalf with his hand up down the front. Thank you. Um, Prime Minister, congrats, I should say congratulations on Finland joining NATO, but I feel like congratulating NATO on joining Finland. Um, look, uh, my question is really about uh, some of the, the qualities that Finland brings, I think, to the international scene. A lot of us in Australia are learning a lot about Finland at the moment, but one lesson that struck me is the culture of transparency in your country. I think the culture of, as some observers would say, quite radical transparency seems to be a real asset in national security, uh, countering foreign interference and so forth. I just wonder if you could say a little about how transparency works in your country. Well, Finland uh, is a transparent uh, country and we have very high rankings when it comes, for example, the freedom of the press and, and, and we have very low, uh, low um, uh, I don't remember the word, but, but we don't have corruption, for example, uh, that kind of corruption. So, so we are very transparent uh, and we are also, I think, very down to earth. For example, politicians, us politicians, we are ordinary people and, and we are uh, meeting the citizens everywhere. We are going to the public libraries and our kids go to public schools and, and, and daycare and, and we are meeting people. So I think it's also very important that we have a society, welfare society, that also the, the leaders and the decision makers are involved at the same life of, as ordinary people. I think that tells a good story of your, of your country, that it's safe, it's secure, that everybody's on the same line, whether you're a prime minister or president or, or whether you are work uh, in the private sector, for example, or, or be a teacher or, or anything. So I think we have a transparent uh, country and very good country. I'm very proud of Finland. <laughs> yes, the lady at the back caught my eye. Yes, Andrea. Hi, uh, Helen Sullivan from the Guardian's Foreign Desk. Um, I wanted to ask, of the, of the fears Finland has when it comes to Russia, um, and what, you know, the leverage that they have with you. What is, the, what is the most real, you know, what is the kind of likeliest scenario that you're planning for? Uh, what do you mean? Uh, for what Russia could do in Finland. So, for example, you're building the fence. Well, we have a, a quite 
extensive military forces, so, so we are not expecting them uh, to engage threat in, in that uh, account. Uh, and we are not seeing anything, any military action uh, near the Finnish border. Actually, uh, I think most of the troops are now in, in Ukraine, so there are less, lesser, uh, less uh, tr Russian troops than, than before. And also the situation in the border is quite calm, but of course we are prepared of different kind of hyper threats uh, that we might uh, see. We all know that, that cybersecurity is very important nowadays, so we are uh, preparing for different kind of cyber attacks, like all, uh, also all other countries are prepared uh, of that. Uh, we are prepared for different kind of hyper uh, threats, misinformation that's been spread it all over the, the dark web and, and also in social media uh, platforms. Uh, so there are a lot of, a lot of uh, possibilities to make uh, a disturbance uh, within societies. But I think the most important thing is to give, when it comes to, for example, um, misinformation, the most important thing is to give people the right information. And we have good journalists, we have good media that will provide that, that information. And we also have very good authority, authority, um, civil servants and, and uh, institutions in Finland uh, that will give the people the right, that, the right information at the right time. And people trust these institutions that it's also very crucial. Um, for example, I can give you an example of that. There were this, this case in Finland where there were spreading rumors that there was something going on in the Finnish border, that there were these big lines of cars and people coming to Finland sites because of war and because of the, the, the Putin has decided uh, to gather more, more uh, troops within Russia. So, so where there were these rumors uh, spreading around the social media in Finland, but Right away, the, the border control, the Finnish authority, 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 how do you say it? Authorities. Authorities. Yes. Uh, they in, immediately put the right information there. They show, showed, showed the footage uh, in the border. There are no lines, there are no cars, there are no, no uh, troops or people coming to Finland. And, and they just told, this is the situation right now in the border. So the rumor died. Uh, but this is only one example what kind of uh, incidents there might be. Speaking of Mr. Putin, um, many of us have been blacklisted by the Russian state this year for things that we've said, but that's nothing compared to you, for example. Um, you must drive him crazy, um, for which congratulations. I mean, all these strong leaders on, on his borders, he probably expected um, these leaders to go along with the war, not to, not to fight back. Is that your sense? Well, I think when it comes to the war in Ukraine, uh, the nations that are closest to Ukraine, the nations that, are, that has a border with Russia, they are the most toughest ones. Uh, and I think, and I have said publicly, that we should have listened to our Baltic uh, and Polish friends much sooner. We have had many strategic discussions in the European Council of Russia. Uh, and, and the Polish and the Baltics uh, have al always said that, that you don't understand the logic of Putin. You don't understand the logic of Russia. And for example, for a long time, Europe was building a strategy towards Russia to closen our economic ties, to buy energy from Russia, to closen those economic ties. And, and we thought that this would prevent a war, that we would have such a close ties to Russia that it would be uh, totally madness to, to go to war with, with any European countries. But this was proven entirely wrong, the thinking that we had. And the Polish and the Baltics, they said that you don't understand the logic behind Putin. He doesn't care about those economic ties. He only cares uh, about, about Russia and, and the Russian uh, view of Europe. And they view Ukraine as part of Russia. They view it as a part of Russia. And that's why they're attacking. They don't care about the economic ties. They don't care about the sanctions. They don't care any of that, I don't think. Uh, we have to make sure that they don't have those resources to continue the war, that they will, they will lose. So the, the sanctions are very important. But, but their mentality is very different. And the, the ones that are very close to Russia, 
they are very tough and, and I have very, very uh, tough, tough friends <laughs> as, as leaders in, in Europe. For example, the Estonian Prime Minister Kaja Kallas, I think she is great and she speaks so strongly uh, when it comes to Russia. Yes, uh, in, the, yes the, in the blue jacket, if you wouldn't mind. Um, Arya Keskinum, <coughs> private citizen. Um, this is a bit of a left field question, but towards the end of next year, we are heading for a referendum on an Indigenous voice to Parliament. I know that the, uh, in Finland there is the Sami Assembly. I know that there's some legislation in front of the Eduskunta at the moment on the Sami Assembly. I was wondering if there is anything you could tell us about how we should not be afraid of a voice to Parliament. Uh, well, thank you for the question. Uh, we have indigenous people in Finland, we have the Sami people, and, and actually we have now presented a uh, law, a bill uh, to the parliament to strengthen their uh, autonomy, autonomy uh, and their, their um, place uh, in the country. Um, and, but of course we also have much to do. Uh, we have to be very frank that we haven't, in, in history, in past, we haven't done right when it comes to indigenous people. I think this is also the history of, of Australia. I think this is the history in everywhere. And we have to make sure that in the future, uh, indigenous people will have full rights and, and also much more autonomous say in, in their own matters. PM, I'm going to take the liberty of asking the last question, if I can. I asked a Swedish friend um, what I should ask you about, and he said I should ask you about the Finnish concept of sisu, which is will or guts or perseverance or tenacity. Tell us a bit about that. Is that a key for understanding Finland and perhaps a key for understanding you? Well, that's very interesting that your Swedish colleague asked that. I think that tells something about Sweden, that they have to ask, ask you, what is... Finnish Sisu. <laughs> so it means guts. It means guts and spirit. Um, it means that, and I can tell you that, that Finland has gone through many hardships. Uh, we have, have been in, in war with Russia and we have had many hardships uh, within our history. And, and Sisu means that whatever comes, whatever comes, we go through it. We as a nation, we will survive and we don't dwell on the past. We look forward. We look forward and, and uh, do our jobs and make sure that our children have a better life in, in the future than, than their parents uh, had before them. So, so I think Sisu tells something about not to dwell on the past, but make sure that you can cope in any situation and, and that you will uh, build a brighter future. Well, ladies and gentlemen, we could go all afternoon. I apologise to those who've been trying to catch my eye, but the Prime Minister has a meeting with Mr Albanese at Kirribilli House. PM, I want to thank you for taking the time to speak to the Institute today. Thank you for giving such a powerful speech. Um, uh, you know, I like the line about common lifelines. Uh, I like the way you, you said that every system needs rules and if in the absence of rules, all we have chaos, all we have is chaos. Uh, I'm also happy to hear a bit about Sisu, and I think everybody here can um, recognise that you have guts and spirit and Sisu in spades. Um, so it's been a privilege to host you. We wish you and your country all the best, and we also wish you happy Independence Day for next week. So if I can, if I can try my finish again, Kitos Parministeri Marine. Thank you very much, Prime Minister. Thank you. That was perfect. Thank you so much.